Welcome to Questions and Answers from Quarantine with Pastor Chris McMichael. Hello there. Welcome to episode number 46 of Questions and Answers from Quarantine. I'm Chris McMichael coming to you from Tennessee in our church, Engrafted Word Church. Got an awesome set of questions today on the Sermon on the Mount. It was emailed to me yesterday. So I'm going to just jump into it. I may actually turn these into two separate little episodes because there's a lot to be covered here. They ask, could you please expound more on Jesus' entire Sermon on the Mount, including the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 through 7? <laughs> that is a daunting request right there. It's an excellent question or request. Um, let me come back to the Beatitudes. Let me ask the first question here. It says, was the sermon on the mount just one sermon, like our services today are one sitting, or was it spread out over several days? The teachings they add are so deep to take in, and we have notebooks. And I, I assume uh, this person is assuming or kind of re remembering or thinking that they were sitting on the hillside with the Sermon on the Mount. They had nothing to write with. How were they supposed to retain all this? So let me answer this first part, that yes, this was one sermon. It's a sermon that covers three chapters, Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. Each chapter is approximately 40 verses. And so you've got, I don't know, you've got, you've got 48, then you've got 34. So you're looking at 82 right there, 82 plus another 27. So you're looking at 109 verses. If you were to write out your typical 45-minute sermon, it would be a lot less, excuse me, a lot more than 109 verses. So this is one sermon, one continuous discussion, one continuous message from the Lord Jesus. And maybe what throws us for a loop is because it's in three different chapters. And so we think maybe these are three different days events. But understand this. Our Bible was not written in chapter and verse form. Our, our epistles, our, our letters, one continuous flow of thought, one continuous letter from a, a, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, the prophets, the major prophets and, and the minor prophets are a collection of prophecies and some historical accounts that were collected together and presented as either the book of Isaiah, the book of Daniel, the book of Jeremiah, books like uh, the historical books like Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther, they cover huge periods of time and events. And so our Bible was not written with chapters and verses originally. Chapters were not added until the 13th century. And they were added so that people could reference and find the scripture quicker. And 300 years later, they said, that's, that's not fast enough. So it wasn't until the 16th century that we began to add verses. And so now we have Mark chapter 5, verse 16, or John chapter 3, verse 16, or, or just as a fun fact, Esther chapter 8, verse 9 is the longest Bible verse in the entire Bible. Esther 8, 9. Go look at it sometime. That is a monster. <laughs> it's a monster of a verse, especially when you consider one of the shortest is in Luke's gospel, and Jesus wept. Excuse me, that's John's gospel. Um, one of the shortest ones in Luke's gospel is, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. That may be the shortest, and Jesus wept. That's probably competing right there. Really short verses, you look at Esther 8, 9, that guy's about four paragraphs long, and it talks about the letter going forth, um, for, I believe from Haman, to destroy the Jews. Anyway, the Sermon on the Mount is one continuous sermon, but it's broken up into three chapters for our reference. Let's see here, next question. Though it covers so many different topics, could one take the entire Sermon on the Mount as one in message to our hearts? Absolutely. And that's a, I don't know if they, they've made that observation and they're asking for confirmation, but it is a brilliant observation. The Sermon on the Mount is the longest recorded sermon of Jesus Christ. And the overall theme of it can be summarized like this. I don't have it composed well in my mind. 
It starts off with the Beatitudes and it concludes by with being a doer on the word, a doer of the word and being built upon the rock. The Sermon on the Mount begins with blessed are the poor in spirit and it concludes with those who refuse to do the word of God, who built their life apart from the word of God. Though they built it, though they did works, their heart was not right with God. Their heart was not right with the word of God and so they built, but life happened to them and their life fell apart. The overall theme of the Sermon on the Mount is all about catching the heart of God and not being caught up with legalistic works. And though serving God requires good works, we see the Lord Jesus throughout the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. He begins to, to point out, I'm not just interested in your works. Many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out devils and in your name done many mighty words and works and deeds? It's not about the good works, it's about having a heart for God. And so the Lord seems to make this distinction that the good works the Bible requires mixed with the heart for God will produce what he calls fruit. You can have good works, but without having a heart right toward God, it won't be fruit, it'll be dead works. So the overall theme is on the heart. He starts off by talking about the Beatitudes, which just means a condition of blessedness. And every Beatitude that we see here in, in Matthew 5, 3 through 11, all has to do with an attitude of the heart. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemaker. Blessed are they which are persecuted. These are all attitudes. He goes on to talk about having, being salt and light and not losing your savor, letting your light shine. Then, because the Lord's about to transition up in Matthew chapter 5 and begin to expound upon, uh, I think, six different Old Testament laws, he, he precedes his discussion on six New Testament laws by saying, I am not about to undo the law. I am not about to do away with the law or undermine the law. I, well, he says, I want you to know that heaven and earth shall pass away before one jot or tittle of this law shall pass away. But he goes on and says, but except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you shall in no ways enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on to take six laws and say, you've heard it said or written of old, of them the old times, this, this, and this, but I say unto you. And so what he was doing is was bringing out the heart of the law. Because if all you have is the law, like thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder, Thou shalt not commit adultery. You can legalistically keep those works and have a heart far from God. And so this is in line with the theme of the Sermon on the Mount, which is get a heart towards God, understand the heart of what God says in his word, and therefore your works won't be dead works. They won't just be good works. They'll be fruit that abounds to your account. That's why Jesus, he takes six laws in Matthew chapter 5, and out of those produces, I think, 27 additional laws trying to teach us what the heart behind each of those laws. He says, you know, thou shalt not kill. But he says, but I say unto you that if you're angry without a cause, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer already. He says, you've heard it say, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's an accurate quote of one of the Ten Commandments, as is, uh, thou shalt not murder. But Jesus says, but I say unto you, if you look after a woman to lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. And so we see the subject is back to the heart. It just keeps coming back to the heart. And back to the heart. He says, you've heard it said, you'll love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. I say, love your enemies and pray for them that persecute you and despitefully use you that you may be children of your Father which is in heaven. So we see this constant recalibration in the Sermon on the Mount of, a, of the theme of the heart. Beatitudes, then here's what the heart behind each of the laws is and, and what we, God's looking for when you obey the law is the heart behind the law. And that's why he, to bring out the heart of any of these laws, he has to take five and six more laws to help paint the picture. Then it goes on in chapter 6 to talk about when you do your alms, don't be like the Pharisees or the self-righteous, but do it secretly. So he's helping you to bring out the heart behind almsgiving and offerings. And he says in verse 5, and when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who want to be seen, but make sure your prayers are in secret. So he's talking about the heart behind proper prayer. 
And then he goes on to teach the Lord's Prayer, which is really a model prayer or a pattern prayer, which shows us the heart behind every prayer session we, we should have. Verse 16, he says, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. So it's not about legalistic offerings. It's not about legalistic prayer. It's not about legalistic fasting. He tells them how to fast from their heart. Because all of these things, all of these works, the Jews were good at. The Jews were masters at keeping laws, but completely missing the heart behind all of it. And so beginning with Matthew 5 and all the Beatitudes and the heart, the heart, the heart, and here's the heart behind six common laws. And here's the heart behind almsgiving. And here's the heart behind prayer. And here's the heart behind fasting. The Lord is trying to teach his people that, that if they're going to enter the kingdom of heaven, it's not just about outward obedience. It's about catching the heart of God and making the heart of God your heart. And we can only, I don't want to say only, one of the most prominent ways we learn the heart of God it's through his word. But we can read his word and become legalistic. And so it becomes a warning. It becomes um, a, a tale, a path of cautiousness. That if I'm reading the Bible, I have to be mindful that in reading the Bible, I'm trying to learn about God. But if I don't try to learn about God when I read the Bible, the Bible can make me legalistic. And even send me to hell in legalistic self-righteousness. Or I can read the Bible and get to know the heart of God and not be legalistic. And so that's what the Lord's doing over and over again throughout the Sermon on the Mount. He's telling the people the kingdom is not about outward obedience only, though there is part of that. The kingdom is within. The kingdom is about obedience. The kingdom is about a heartfelt faith in God, a heartfelt love for him. He goes on to say, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It would be, I haven't looked it up, but it would be worth going and seeing how many times the word heart is used throughout the Sermon on the Mount. No man can serve two masters. That's talking about the heart. And then he talks about don't take any thought what you shall care for or wear because the Lord knows you have need of these things, but seek first the kingdom. Then chapter 7 starts talking about biblical judgment, how to accurately judge. Don't judge one another ruthlessly, but judge yourself first. Then you can judge other people to help them. And then give not that which is holy unto dogs. So it's all about the heart of judgment. Chapter 7 begins this heart of judgment. And what is the heart behind judgment? Because we have to practice judgment. We have to practice discernment. We have to practice discretion. We have to help one another. And we can't help somebody without judging that they need help and judging that I am qualified to help them. So we're finding the accurate heart behind judgment. We don't judge people to cast them off as hopeless. We certainly don't have a biblical right to, to judge people to damnation. But you can't help people without judging them. You've got to first recognize you're in trouble. How, you know, to, to perform the Heimlich maneuver, you have to be a judge. You have to be able to look across the restaurant or a table and see that somebody's choking. And you have to judge they're choking. Hmm. Well, I shouldn't say anything because I might be labeled a judgy hater. Or you can say, man, they're really struggling. They're, they're not just coughing on something. They're really coughing and now they're, they're, they're pointing at their chest and they're grabbing their throat and looking at you. I wonder if I should do something. Even wondering if you should do something is an act of judgment. And so then you get up and if you know how to do the Heimlich maneuver, well, you've got to judge them. Are they going to be mad at me if I get, a, get behind them and give them that great big bear hug with my thumb buried in their solar plexus or right there beneath their diaphragm? And then you got to give them a squeeze and you got to judge whether it was a hard enough squeeze. And then you got to listen and judge their breathing. And if that's not good enough, then you keep popping until that big chunk of country ham comes flying out. To save somebody's life took you a lot of judgment from start to finish. And once you've saved their life, the conversation is not going to be about how judgy you were. The conversation is going to be about thank you. I don't know why I didn't swallow a chew before I swallowed that. Anyway, Matthew 7 goes on about the heart behind judgment and then enter into the straight gate. Beware false prophets. You shall know them of their fruit. So that's judgy. Straight gate, wide gate, you got to judge. So they, 
Jesus is teaching us the heart behind accurate judgment in all of Matthew chapter 7. And then it goes into talking about evil fruit and good fruit. So now we're judging between evil and good, false prophets and real prophets, sheeps and wolves. So we got a lot of judginess going on, but it's all ordained of God because he's taught us the heart behind it. And then he says that you got to not just have uh, wonderful works, but works that are lawful and law abiding. Otherwise he'll say, I never knew you. And then it concludes by saying, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. And that's the key that ties it all the way back to Matthew 5 in the beginning. How do we have beatitudes? By hearing the sayings of God and doing them. We don't want to hear the sayings of them and not do them because we'll continue building and everything will fall apart. So is it one message to our hearts? Absolutely. With one continuous theme. And it's the sermon that sets up the whole transition of Israel from the law of Moses to the law of love or the law of grace of the church age, from, from the mosaic legalism of the old covenant to grace and truth by Jesus Christ. Because God is about to move from the outside of tabernacles and temples made with hands into the fleshy temple of the human soul, a body, and dwell in the hearts of mankind. So the whole overarching theme of the Sermon on the Mount is basically this kingdom is all about your heart. It's not about your legalistic works. It's about your heart. And if your heart will do the word, then your heart will produce good fruit. If you have a, no heart for God, but you do the works, they could be dead works. So let's see. Um, could you expound more on the Sermon on the Mount, including the Beatitudes? I may just have to save that for, uh, for the next one because we're already at 16 minutes on this so far. But... I guess to answer just those first two questions, it's one sermon broken over three chapters. Chapters weren't added until the 13th century. And the overall theme is written to our heart. It's all about our hearts capturing the heart of God. And, and to that end, I might say, anytime you study the Bible, anytime you study any doctrine, anytime you study any text, any passage, any law, any judgment, any divine judgment, wrathful judgment, any blessing, any divine blessing in the Bible, you've got to ask yourself and pray and ask God, what was the heart behind this, Lord? You said that if a woman has an issue of blood, she's to be put outside the camp for seven days. What, what was the heart behind that? Because I don't think we do that in the New Testament. What was the purpose behind that? We're not looking for blind obedience, God is not looking for blind obedience. He wants us to seek him and understand him. Ephesians tells us, be not ignorant of the will of God. Be not ignorant of what God wants. And God is not hidden from us. He's not far away from us. He wants to reveal his heart, his nature, his, his character, his goodness to us. We've just got to press in and ask questions. It is possible to be related to somebody and never know them. It's possible to work for somebody and never know them. And, and just like that's the case, whether it's a distant cousin or it's a boss, you can have a connection to them and never know them. It's possible to be a child of God and never know him. It's possible to be a servant for God, but never know him. And if that's the case, that's a miserable life to live, devoid of some of the blessings and the richness God wants to provide for us. What we need to do is knowing that we're a child of God, Get to know him. And as a servant of God, don't just work for God, work with him. Be a co-laborer, a joint laborer together with him. And in doing that, you'll get to know his nature better. You'll get to know his, his character better. And when you know his nature and his character, when you read hard to understand passages, you'll be able to say, yeah, I totally understand why my God did that. I totally understand why he vindicated Eleazar for throwing a javelin between Cosby and um, that other guy uh, for fornicating in the camp right after God had just destroyed all the, the worshipers of the golden calf. I totally understand why God said, Eleazar is a man after my own heart. This shall be accounted unto him as righteousness. Eleazar murdered two fornicators, an Amalekite and an Israelite. And God counted it as righteousness, just like he did the faith of Abraham. When you know the heart of God, you understand why that was a righteous act. When you don't know the heart of God, you think, man, God's a meanie weenie. Eleazar's a murderer. Oh, he, he murdered two people that were in love. What was it? 
That's ignorance. Let us get to know the heart of our God. I would say the Sermon on the Mount is one of the best sermons you could ever study in all of the Gospels. And the more you study it and understand it, the more you'll know the heart of God and what he's doing in this church age. I think that's sufficient for this uh, round of questions and answers. Call you blessed. We'll see you in the next episode, which should be, I think, 46 or 47. I've already forgotten. We're winding this thing down. As I've said, I only, I'm only going to do 50 of these because they take a lot of work. And hopefully you'll get your questions in by the time we're done. See you in the next episode. Continue to pray for our nation in Jesus' name.